Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Jeff, for preaching for me last week. I did get an opportunity to watch him on the live feed. I think that's the first time I've done that and um, enjoyed that. He's back. He's heard me thank him earlier. He's not here to hear me preach, though, but to hear his wife sing, who will be joining in the trio. And... um, You'll enjoy that very much. Maybe as much as you enjoyed Jeff singing last week. <laughs> did get to see that. What you didn't notice, perhaps, was he enjoyed singing that rock and roll. You could see it in his face. And um, he tried to get you all to join in. I'm glad you didn't, because he would have just kept going and singing that. But uh, I thought, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Get to your sermon, and he did. Stick with what you know, Jeff, which is <laughs> preaching, and you did a good job. <laughs> well, to get a little more serious now, we um, are coming to really the conclusion pretty soon of our studies in Mark. We're in Mark chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 33 through 41, which does bring us to the central event of the Word of God and the central event of all history. We begin with verse 33 of chapter 15. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, Behold, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave him a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion, who was standing right in front of him, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Less, and Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him And there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. One of the famous lines of Shakespeare we learned in high school and that stayed with us, at least stayed with me, was, out damned spot, out I say. It's Lady Macbeth. She wasn't trying to get her dog out the door. She was trying to cleanse her conscience of guilt for her part in the king's murder. What, she asked, will these hands ne'er be clean? No, they wouldn't be. She couldn't remove the stain of her sin. And the guilt of it would drive her to madness and death. I wonder if Shakespeare knew Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 22. Although you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your iniquity is before me, declares the Lord God. Well, whether it's the bard or the prophet, the message is the same. Sin is a stain on the soul too deep for any soap to remove The message of Mark is the only solvent for sin is the blood of God's Son. His sacrificial death is the only solution for the sin problem. That's the sole reason He came into the world. To die in the place of His elect ones. To pay the penalty for their sins and make them clean. From the beginning of Mark's Gospel, the story has been moving toward that event, the central event of history, the death of Christ. 
That's where we arrive in our study in Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through 39. Mark is the only gospel writer to give a full timetable of the events. According to verse 25, the Lord was brought to Golgotha at the third hour, which was nine o'clock in the morning, and was crucified. Three hours later, something unusual happened. Darkness at noon. Verse 33. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. That was the first of a series of miraculous signs that occurred. The darkness was followed by the rending of the veil in the temple. An earthquake opened the graves of dead saints who came to life. And the crowd that had gathered around the cross left mourning. Mark doesn't record the earth shaking and the tombs opening. Matthew records that. And Mark doesn't explain how the first of these, the darkness occurred that covered the whole land. It wasn't a solar eclipse. It couldn't have been. It was the Passover, which is always observed at the time of a full moon. An eclipse cannot happen when the moon is full. Best explanation is that this was a miracle, a case of divine intervention when God covered the sun. Prophet Amos said that God would make the sun go down at noon and make that day a time of mourning and weeping for an only son. And he did that over Golgotha. For three hours, Jerusalem and Judea, the land, which could mean the whole earth, but, but certainly, and I think probably does mean Judea, was shrouded in darkness. These were silent hours. The previous three had been filled with the taunts of spectators who mocked Jesus. He had prayed for his enemies and promised paradise to the criminal beside him. But from the sixth hour until the darkness ended, there was silence. We have no record of people speaking. It was not until the ninth hour, Mark wrote, that Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that tells us why the darkness happened. God's judgment was on His Son. As Paul explained in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, God made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He became our substitute in judgment. And our sins were imputed to Him, transferred from us and put to the Lord's account so that He became the sin bearer. So now, in the darkness, He was experiencing desertion. Because sin separates man from God. And the father of necessity had to shield himself from his own son who had become sin on our behalf. We cannot begin to comprehend the suffering our Lord experienced in those three hours on the cross. We have a sense of the humiliation and physical pain he endured. And all of that was great. But that was not his greatest agony. It was the spiritual suffering of this separation from the Father, which was spiritual death. At that moment, Christ was undergoing hell for us. Now we wonder how that could be. How the endless punishment of hell could be experienced and exhausted in a moment of time on the cross. We can't fully understand it, but to gain some sense of it, and I think we can gain some sense of it, we need to understand that this was a unique death. It was the death of the God-man. Christ's human nature is finite. His divine nature is infinite. And though his suffering occurred in his human nature, it affected his divine nature, making the death 
of infinite and eternal value. We can illustrate how that happened from our own experience. Man is both body and soul, physical and psychological, material and immaterial. And though we are material and immaterial, body, soul and spirit, the two are distinct from one another, but inextricably connected to one another, and they affect each other. The body affects the mind, the mind affects the body. For example, when a person burns his finger, the soul is not burned, it's not physical or material, but it's affected, because when the finger hurts, the whole person suffers physically and mentally. In a similar way, when, when the Lord suffered in His human nature and died physically, His divine nature was affected. It did not die. God cannot die. But what occurred in His human nature affected His divine nature because both the human and divine are joined in one person, the one person of Jesus Christ, just as we are each one person, body and soul. And because it was the God-man who suffered, his suffering was infinite. The theologian William G.T. Shedd has very good discussions on all of this, and he illustrated the infinite value of Christ's death by comparing the suffering of a human with that of an animal. Animals suffer when subjected to pain, but the character and value of the suffering in a human is much greater than that of an animal because of man's higher personality. We are rational and immortal as opposed to animals, which are not rational creatures. We're made in the image of God. That's what separates us from the animals. Animals don't bear the image of God. The suffering of a being is elevated in its intensity and value with the higher nature of that being. But we don't think anything, for example, of killing a housefly. In fact, we're happy when we kill a housefly. But we don't feel the same way about harming a pet dog. That doesn't give us pleasure. Cruelty to animals is unlawful, but cruelty to humans is criminal. And murder is a capital offense. And why is that? because of the higher value of human beings. We're made in the image of God. So since God is the highest being of all and of infinite value, the suffering that affected His person must also be infinite. So that on the cross, Jesus Christ did suffer hell fully in a moment. It was intense pain beyond anything we can know or comprehend. But what we can know is, this is when our salvation was accomplished. When the payment for sin was made. When the debt was settled. That is what was happening under the cover of darkness, and that is what those three hours of darkness signified. Christ was suffering hell for us, in our place, as our substitute. But few, if any, of those who were standing around the cross understood any of this. They didn't even realize that he was reciting Psalm 22, verse 1. They mistook his cry, Eloi, Eloi, my God, my God, for a prayer to Elijah. Elijah was revered by the Jews, according to 2 Kings chapter 2, he didn't die, but was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. Some Jews believed that he would come and rescue the righteous. Some who were there thought Jesus was crying out for the prophet's help, which is, I think, a, a window on the soul of the people and their spiritual dullness. They thought in terms of fables, not Scripture. But it caused a response. It, it was the wrong response to a foolish statement, but it brought about a glorious thing. Someone ran and got a sponge filled with sour wine and gave it to him. And again, 
what that did, as we see all through this, these events in our Lord's life, as his life comes to an end, that was a fulfillment of Scripture. It was a foolish act, and yet through that, God fulfilled Psalm 69, verse 21, they gave me vinegar to drink. It's a further confirmation of the truth of all of this. Then they waited to see if Elijah would come. He didn't. No one could rescue Jesus. Not even Jesus could save himself. Not if he were to save others. This was the painful reason he came to die. And Mark writes in verse 37 that he did. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Matthew wrote that he yielded up his spirit wasn't taken from him. He yielded it up, indicating that it was his decision. There were seven statements made, according to the Gospels. Under the cover of darkness, Jesus made the fourth, the so-called cry of dereliction. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was followed by the fifth statement. I thirst, and then the sixth statement, his triumphant declaration, it is finished. Finally, with the spiritual death completed and the, the work of atonement done, all that remained was his physical death, which was also part of the judgment. The penalty of, for sin is death, physically as well as spiritually. And so Luke recounts, Summoning up all of his strength, he cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And Luke wrote, he breathed his last. It was an unusual death. We see that for a number of reasons. First of all, because a man who is, is nearly dead by crucifixion would not have the strength to make a loud cry. That's what he does. He doesn't simply... Speak, he cried out in a loud voice. That's what the Lord did. That's highly unusual. John tells us that when he died, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, generally, that's not how things follow. What generally happens, almost always happens, is a person's spirit leads, leaves him or her, and then the head falls, naturally. But this was different. He first bowed his head, indicating he was in control of all of these events, even his own death. He died not because he could not help it, but because he willed it. The judgment was over. His work was finished. And he was ready to return to his heavenly home. And so he triumphantly entrusted himself into the hands of his father, and he breathed his last, Mark says. Then Mark tells us that another extraordinary event occurred. The veil of the temple, the curtain separating the Holy of Holies from the holy place, was torn in two from top to bottom. It was elaborately woven from yarn of blue, white, red, and purple with representations of angels, the cherubim. And its function was to prevent access into the Holy of Holies where God symbolically dwelt, where He was symbolically enthroned over the Ark of the Covenant. It, it symbolized the separation between God and man due to sin. Only once a year on the Day of Atonement could the high priest enter through the veil with the blood of the sacrifice which he sprinkled on the mercy seat of the Ark for the sins of the people. So... When the Lord cried, it is finished, and died, and the veil that is reported to have been as thick as a man's hand, when that was suddenly torn in two, the significance of it was clear. Everything the sacrifices had pointed to was fulfilled. Christ had atoned for sin. He had satisfied God's justice. The, the separation was over. 
And the way to God was open for all who would put their trust in Christ. Mark says the veil was torn from top to bottom, indicating this is from God. This was an event from heaven. The, the old covenant, the law of Moses, with its ceremonies and priests and sacrifices was finished. Any more sacrifices and offerings would be useless. Nothing more needs to be done. Nothing more can be done. Christ has done it all, paid it all. He is the only and the completely sufficient Savior. The same word is used in chapter 1 of the heavens opening at Jesus' baptism when the Father declared that He was well pleased with His Son. The word is literally, the heavens were torn open. That's what the Lord did. He tore open heaven for sinners. For all who believe in Him as the bleeding Savior whose death atoned for all our sins, who so satisfied God's justice that our guilt is forever removed. And not only is heaven opened up as our eternal home in the future, as our glorious and certain hope, which it is, but also we have the present privilege of access to heaven through prayer. Heaven is presently open to us all day, every day. The author of Hebrews urges us to, to act upon that in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 to draw near with confidence to the throne of grace or draw near with boldness to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. And we are always in need. From the time you go to bed at night to the time you get up in the morning, you are surrounded by thousands of dangers that you don't even know of. When you get out of bed, you're getting out of bed to go into a world that is filled with dangers you don't see and you can't comprehend. In the air, in the traffic, or wherever you are, there are dangers out there. We're always in need of God's mercy and grace. And He's opened up heaven for us. So we always need to be drawing near to God in prayer. God desires that. He wants that from us. We're not imposing upon us. He's told us to come with confidence to the throne of grace continually. That's what we were made for. We were made for fellowship. We were made for fellowship with the Lord God. And when we were lost, He found us and bought us by His Son through His death, so that we would be reunited with Him in fellowship. Augustine said it in the first prayer of his confessions. It's right there at the beginning on the first page of his confessions. and It's probably the best known statement that Augustine made. God has made us for Himself and our hearts are restless until they rest in Him. That's true. Rest in Him. Fellowship with Him. So we're always to be drawing near to Him. This is what He desires from us. He's a good God. He's not a tyrant. He doesn't force us and chide us. But He invites us to come to Him continually in prayer and study and personal relationship. That's where we find rest. That's where we find fulfillment. And that's where we find help. Christ did that for us on the cross and the torn veil signified it. Now, this rending of the veil happened at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which was the time of the evening sacrifice. The priests would have been in the temple engaged in their duties. They would have seen it happen. And we would assume they would have been deeply affected by it because they would have known that this was from God. The rending of this large, thick veil suddenly is torn from top to bottom. That would have an effect, you would think. And this may be one reason we read in Acts chapter 6 and verse 7 that the Word of God spread and Luke writes, a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. 
Something had happened to these men. Well, the preaching of the gospel, certainly. But perhaps this had occurred, that they knew this had occurred, and it had an effect. It was a miracle. All of the events, the unusual darkness, the earthquake, and the Lord's composure during all of this made an impression on one man in particular, the Roman centurion who was supervising the crucifixion. When Jesus died, he declared, truly, this man was the Son of God. As a soldier, he'd seen many deaths on the battlefield and on crosses, but he never witnessed a death like this one where the person showed so much control and majesty through it all. In fact, the centurion may have supervised the Lord's flogging. If so, then he had seen the events from the beginning. He, he witnessed the, the terrible cruelty the Lord suffered at the hands of the soldiers. He watched as people, priests and thieves on either side, taunted and mocked him. He saw how Jesus responded to it. Not with insults of his own, but with prayer for his enemies. He heard the promise of paradise to the repentant thief hanging beside him. That's what Luke records. He witnessed wonders and knew that an innocent man had died. He knew God's son had died. So of all the signs and wonders that accompanied the crucifixion, this one is really the most miraculous. The insight given to a Roman centurion. That a Roman, that a Gentile, a pagan could crucify Christ, put him on a cross, which to the Romans was the most despised instrument of execution the most shameful form of death reserved only for the worst of people, the worst of criminals, that he could do that and then confess that he is the Son of God, that was truly a work of sovereign grace. That, that was the confession the Romans ascribed to the Emperor Caesar. He's the Son of God. So a Roman declaring that Jesus, a crucified man... A dead carpenter was the Son of God would have had special meaning for Mark's Roman readers. Legend has it that this man's name was Longinus and that he became a Christian and he died a martyr's death. We don't know if that's true, but, but surely it's fair to assume that the grace that began in this man continued and brought him to a full faith in the one he confessed to be God's son. That, confess, that confession confirmed the very point of Mark's gospel, which opens with the words, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. And a Roman gave an amen to that. What, what an unexpected end to the Lord's beautiful life. He died rejected by his own people but accepted by one who was not of his people, a Gentile. It indicates something very important about the death of Christ. It was not for the Jewish people only. It was for Romans. It was for Greeks. For all nations across the globe and down through the ages. At the beginning of Luke's Gospel, the first person to speak to Jesus in Jerusalem after his birth was the old prophet Simeon who took the child in his arms and praised God for him and said that in seeing Jesus he had seen God's salvation who, through, who would be a light to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. And here we see the light beginning to break upon the Gentiles. And soon it would go out to all the nations. But the centurion wasn't the only one to be deeply affected by the Lord's death. Luke wrote that the crowds 
that had gathered at the cross were moved as well. There were mainly people of Jerusalem who were not committed to Christ. They're like, not like the Galilean pilgrims who had come up for the, for the feast and who hailed him as the king and uh, put their garments in front of him in the palm branches. These are the people of Jerusalem and they had no special interest in him. They'd come out to see a crucifixion. Public executions have always attracted crowds, but instead of being entertained by what they'd witnessed, they became deeply moved and grieved by it. The mocking of many had turned into mourning. Luke wrote that when they had observed what had happened, they began to return beating their breasts. They may not have understood all that had taken place. I don't think even we understand all that had taken place. And certainly at that cross they didn't, but they felt grief and guilt over the death of Christ. Something was not right about this, they knew. And no doubt it was preparation for the conversion of many Jews on the day of Pentecost. Others were grieving from a distance. The Lord's friends are mentioned in verse 40, signify, uh, specifically some women who, uh, who followed Him and ministered to Him in Galilee. Mark lists their names. We're familiar with some of them. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Less and Joseph and Salome. They'd come up from Galilee with Him and had remained with Him to the bitter end. The disciples had fled. John came back and was there at the cross with the Lord's mother, but all of the others were gone. They'd gone into hiding. But the women, they stayed with Him. How much of what they witnessed they understood, it's hard to say. Probably very little. In fact, I think what we see in the next chapter suggests they understood very little because we see them going to the tomb and they're surprised by the resurrection. They weren't expecting it, which indicates they knew very little. What, what, what stands out here, though, is their devotion to Christ. Their willingness to stand with Him in this most difficult of hours. And that devotion would grow to faith and understanding very soon. It was Friday afternoon. On Sunday morning, their sorrow would be turned to joy and they would learn the reason for this that it was necessary for Him to die so that they could live forever. He has obtained life for every one of His people, and it is ours, ours at the very moment of faith. That's when we take possession of it. That's when the blessings of His blood are applied to us. That's when the stain of sin is removed. That's when the sinner is justified, declared righteous by God, forgiven of all his or her sins, and clothed in white. That's the hope of the gospel that was given by the prophets in the Old Testament. Isaiah said, though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. John, looking into the future, saw a great multitude in heaven, clothed in white robes, because they had washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What a picture that is. What a paradox that is. Blood that doesn't stain, but makes white. That's a miracle. That's what God does for every one who believes in Christ. He does what we cannot do. We cannot move, remove the stain of sin. It's too deep in the soul. No soap or cleanser in the world. No amount of work can get that stain out. The more a person tries, the deeper the stain is. Only the blood of Christ can do that. Which is a way of saying, only the death of Christ can do that. And it removes our sin because it was substitutionary. He died in our place. He took our punishment for us. He paid our debt. And the moment we believe, the payment is certified. We're declared spiritually whole. 
forgiven of all and righteous before God. What a blessing. Lady Macbeth, whose sin drove her mad, was a fiction. But real sins haunt real people and drive them to despair. But it's all removed from the believer forever. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Have you heard it? Well, you've heard it this morning. Have you believed it? Or are you still stained with sin? The way to cleansing, to forgiveness, is the cross. Believe in Christ the Savior. He is the Son of God. That's all one must do. That's an amazing thing. All one must do is put one's trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all one must do, but it's what one must do. Salvation is a free gift. It's all of grace. It's by the sovereign grace of God. But those with with white robes in heaven have them because, as John said, they washed them. They washed them. The way a person dips his stains in the Savior's blood is by believing in Him. That's how we wash our sins away. And that's what the unbeliever must do to have the blessings that we speak of here. Put your faith and trust in Him. You can't do that in your own strength, but you can do it in the strength of God. And if you have a sad and you see the truth of what is written here, then that is a work of God in your heart and He's moving you. Respond to that. Trust in Christ. May God help you to do that. And when you do that, you will be white as snow, whole, and perfect before God, and set out on a mission to serve Him and serve Him well. May God help all of us to do that. Well, let's conclude with a hymn. I don't think we have a... Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> I was going to say we don't have a hymn, uh, a song leader, but we do. Um, Let's uh, stand and sing hymn number 48 in the white book. Father, what a great truth that is and what a great thing to sing. That our Redeemer has purchased our forgiveness and washed our sins away. They're gone. We'll never bring them before us to our condemnation again. We give you thanks. And yes, we will praise you in the few days that we have in this world and then for all eternity. Praise you for your grace, your saving mercy. Thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen.